Hello folks, and welcome to Space, Time, and Einstein. I'm Brian Roberts. In the last videos, we saw some mind-bending thought experiments that gave rise to time dilation, length contraction, and the relativity of simultaneity. But isn't there some way to make these things a little easier to visualize? Today, we're introducing the concept of a space-time. The concept of space-time was actually not invented by Einstein, but by the mathematician Hermann Minkowski in 1907. Minkowski wrote, Henceforth, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows, and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. Let's build the space-time, shall we? To begin, start with a snapshot of space, like a photograph. Take another snapshot a few minutes later, and another snapshot a few minutes later. Actually, suppose you took snapshots at every instant in between as well, and made a giant infinite stack of photographs. That stack of photographs allows us to visualize both space and time. That is, it's a space-time. Moving to the right, I'll get a line tilted to the right. Moving to the left, then I'd get a line tilted to the left. And the greater the tilt, the faster the body is moving. If I have a rock that just sits at rest in the grass and take photographs of it, it's gonna look like a straight vertical line in space-time. Let's drop the photographs now and leave two axes for space and one axis for time, the vertical one. Two axes for space, don't get cheap on me, but drawing in four dimensions is so hard. We're gonna get back to drawing in four dimensions when it comes to gravity, but don't be alarmed. We're gonna draw just two dimensions of space to keep things simple. Now, one speed in special relativity is particularly important, and that's the speed of light in a vacuum. 186,000 miles per second. By convention, we represent that speed by a 45 degree angle. And we sometimes refer to that speed using the letter C. Why C? Celeritas? Maybe Einstein liked celery. The light postulate says the speed of light is the same in every reference frame, so I'll always draw it at 45 degrees. Now I can draw all kinds of interesting things in a space time. For example, here's a light clock at rest in my reference frame. I've got one end of the light clock on the left and the other end on the right. The light clock is not moving in my reference frame, so those two ends are just vertical lines, and a beam of light is bouncing back and forth between the two ends at 45 degrees. What about inertial motion? Remember inertial motion? Inertial motion is constant speed in a straight line. So inertial motion in a space-time is represented by a straight line. There's another fancy word for that that you should know. A straight line through space-time is sometimes called a geodesic. Not all motion is along a straight line. Let's go back to the photographs to try to visualize this. When the Earth orbits the Sun, I might put it here in January, here in April, here in July, and here in October. Now suppose I stack those images up and fill in all the instants in between to make a space-time. The result would be a spiraling curve. It's not an inertial reference frame in this space-time because it's not a straight line, but it is an accelerated body orbiting in a circle and depicted in space-time on this spiraling curve. The next tool we'll need to understand space-times is called a light cone. A light cone is a crucial concept. We're gonna use it not just here in special relativity, but in general relativity as well. To begin, imagine a bulb flashes and that a ring of light expands away from the bulb over time. If we were to depict how these rings change over time, we'd find an ever-growing sequence of circles stacking up to form a cone. Now suppose we have the opposite, a ring of light which is collapsing down to a source. If we depict that motion in space-time, we find a cone oriented in the opposite direction. Now put the two things together, a ring of light that collapses to a source, and then a bulb that flashes so that the light rings expand out again. The resulting double cone is called a light cone. It's a cone in space-time with its edges describing the motion of light. The top part of this double cone is sometimes called the future light cone of my event, and the bottom cone is called the past light cone. Any curve describing a body moving less than the speed of light is called a time-light curve. Time as in time is passing. A curve on the light cone is called a light-light curve. It's the path that a particle of light could travel. And any other curve at all is called a space-like curve. Whether or not a bulb actually flashes, it's helpful to depict what the rings of light would have done if it had. We could imagine it happening at all different points in space-time, and so we'd have light cones at every point in space-time. Throughout our discussion, I'll use the word event to refer to something that happened at a place and at a time. So my living room couch is not an event. It's just a place. Two o'clock is not an event. It's just a time. Let's start with some event, like the moment of your first kiss. It happens at a place and a time. Now draw the double cone, the light cone, at that same event, 
and let's see what we can learn from this scenario. If the body were to move to the right, the line would tilt a little to the right. If the body were moving to the left, it would tilt to the left. If its speed were increasing, the body would tilt more and more. And as the speed approaches the speed of light, it tilts closer and closer to the edge of the cone. Now we're soon going to learn that what it's not possible for you to do is tilt beyond the speed of light. That is, you cannot travel faster than the speed of light. Then the boundary of that cone is your speed limit. You can tilt your curve ever closer to the cone, but you cannot ever reach that cone and you certainly cannot pass it. You can't travel at or greater than the speed of light. One of the neat things about these light cones is that it tells you how events are connected by time-like curves. For example, suppose you begin at the event that is your first kiss. Which events, that is, which places and times, can you visit after that? You could stay at rest and just travel a vertical line, or you could move to the right or to the left, but however you move, you'll always move less than the speed of light. That is, the only events that you can visit are the ones in your future light cone. Suppose I ask instead which events you could have come from to get to your first kiss. What are the places and times you could have started at and arrived at your first kiss on time? Again, you could have started at rest and just stayed there, or you could have been in motion to the right or to the left, but you couldn't have traveled faster than the speed of light. That means the only events that you could have come from are in your past light cone. So when you start with an event and you draw the light cone around that event, the events in the future light cone are events that you could possibly arrive at. And the events in your past light cone are those that you could possibly have come from. All the other events are ones that you will never ever experience. These are some neat ideas for thinking about space and time, but they're not just toys. We'll soon put them to work as a powerful way to analyze the central results of special relativity. Thanks folks, stay safe. We'll see you next time.